Hey there, sports history fan. This is Arnie Chapman of the Football History Dude Podcast, and I'm stopping by this show real quick to tell you about a couple of cool giveaways that we have going on here at the network. Both are autographed books covering various topics of the NFL. The first is The Point After, How One Resilient Kicker Learned There Is More to Life Than the NFL by ex-NFL kicker Sean Conley. It goes over his unique experience as a walk-on kicker at the University of Pitt after never playing high school football. And then it gets into some of his time playing for NFL teams and so much more beyond the gridiron. The other is from author Kevin Bryant. His book is titled Spies on the Sidelines, the High Stakes World of NFL Espionage. This book started as a curiosity, kind of a passion project to understand everything revolving around well, Spygate. But this put Kevin down a rabbit hole learning about all sorts of espionage that has occurred throughout the history of the NFL. Both permissible <laughs> and often the illicit techniques of gathering intel to try to impact the outcome of the game. To sign up for your chance to win an autographed copy of one of these books, all you gotta do is head over to sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash giveaways and sign up. That's sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash giveaways. Again, check out all the other podcasts that we have in the Sports History Network as well. But now, back to your regularly scheduled journey to the Sports History Timeline. It's that time of the week again where we share some football archaeology from Timothy P. Brown, a historian and author of some great books and the founder of footballarchaeology.com as he shares one of the great stories of a defensive scoring and a first has ever happened. Coming up in just a moment. This is the Pigskin Daily History Dispatch, a podcast that covers the anniversaries of American football events throughout history on a day-to-day basis. Your host, Darren Hayes, is podcasting from America's North Shore to bring you the memories of the gridiron one day at a time. So as we come out of the tunnel of the Sports History Network, let's take the field and go no huddle through the portal of positive gridiron history with pigskindispatch.com. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Hello, my football friends. This is Darren Hayes of PigsandDispatch.com. Welcome once again to the Pig Pen, your portal to positive football history. And as we try to do every week, we're going to touch base with Timothy Brown, the author and gridiron historian that has the footballarchaeology.com website. And he has his daily tidbits where he tells us some great information. Uh, football, that's just a, a quick little read that you can enjoy each day. Uh, Tim, welcome back to the Pig Pen. Hey, thank you, Darren. Looking forward to chatting again. Yeah, uh, Tim, before we get going into the tidbit topic, uh, maybe you could give us like a dust cover version of one of my favorite books, and you authored it, How Football Became Football the First 150 Years. You know, what, what exactly is the book about and its intent? So, you know, I, I guess it starts with my looking at football broadly. Uh, you know, I think most of the, the books that I've read, um, and I've read a lot of books on football history, most of them are either pretty kind of academically oriented or they're about one team or about one game or one player. And so I just wanted to uh, put together uh, cover, cover kind of the, the totality of the game. So it's not just the game on the field. It's the, it's the, the coaches, it's officiating, it's the nature of the player equipment, the fan fan experience. So I try to bring all of that together and, and kind of show the kind of show the progression of the way the game evolved um, in each of those dimensions. And, um, you know, so I, I cover, you know, things you would expect. So, you know, you'll read about John Heisman, Walter Camp and Paul Brown, but, you know, you also will come across people like, like, uh, Frank Birch and John Lockney and other people you maybe never have heard at, never have heard of, but they've affected the game and the game that, you know, today wouldn't be the same game without them. So, um, and hopefully, you know, like try to add a little dash of humor or kind of dad puns and those kinds of things in there. And, you know, uh, hopefully it works. If it doesn't, I apologize. <laughs> but I can attest to it. You know, folks, if you don't have a copy of that book, get one right away. You know, go to Amazon and some of the other, I'm sure you have other places that you can buy it also. But it, the book is so relatable. 
I, I know you've mentioned four groups of people, you know, the, the fans, the coaches, the players, and the officials. Well, I can relate to three of those. I was never a coach, but the other three, I, I, I did, was all of them and still am a fan. And I, it was so interesting because you took sort of that, you know, period by period approach and you told about the evolving of each of those, you know, how the officiating evolved, how the players evolved, how the rules evolved, how coaches evolved to, to all the rules. And it's just such an interesting story. And it is really one of the most in-depth uh, books I've ever seen on early football. So my hat's off to you. It's very well done. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate it. It was a lot of fun. Tim, I noticed though, one of your latest tidbits you had back in April 26, you talked about football's first scoop and score. Maybe you could uh, tell us a little bit about that story. Yeah. So this is, this is one of those where, you know, some of the, some of the things I write about are things I just kind of happened upon, you know, and it's a, they're actually some of the, to me, the ones that are most fun, but you know, I was, I was doing some research, trying to find certain articles on a certain topic. And I basically, I was looking for the origins of the word fumble. You know, when did that first come up in, in uh, football in the newspaper? And so it was this game. Uh, so it was a game uh, in 1882 between uh, Princeton and Lafayette. And so um, somewhere in the game, um, Lafayette was running with the ball. Uh, they dropped it. And this guy named T.H. Harris, who was played on for Princeton for a couple of years, picked up the ball and ran it in for a touchdown. Went like, uh, you know, it basically just said, you know, that he ran the better part of the field. Uh, so, so for in my, as far as I can tell, this was the first recorded fumble and it was also the first scoop and score. So I just, you know, thought that's kind of a cool little, uh, cool little story. <laughs> they didn't call it a scoop and score that that came later, but, um, but it was, you know, so it was the first fumble that's mentioned in the newspaper. And so then the question is why, you know, why did it take that long? I mean, it, the game was a couple, you know, six years old at that point, but so, you know, I mean, you know, my best, you know, educated guest at, at it is that the, um, the game, well, uh, so, you know, it, it's probably, you know, two, two things going on. One is that the, um, there'd been a significant change in, in the points scored the previous year or it, in, in 1882, how, how, how they calculated who won the game. And then, then there was also um, a significant rule change in terms of the introduction of the scrimmage. So as far as, far as having possession is what you're saying for, for that rule. Yeah. So it was, um, so, you know, football, came from rugby and everybody knows that, but again, this is one of these places where we can emphasize early on football or was rugby. It didn't, it wasn't, it was rugby. <laughs> and then in, in 1882, um, it, it had some, some things uh, go on in games in 1880 and 81 that, you know, made the game pretty boring. So, um, so they changed the rules. So there was a, uh, whoever had the ball, would keep the ball for three downs. If, and if they could gain five yards, they could keep it for another three downs. So 82 was the first year where we had what they called the rule of possession. Until then, if somebody dropped the ball, um, just like they do in rugby today, somebody drops the ball, somebody falls on it, then you have a scrum. And you, you know, the scrum determines who gets possession of the ball. Whereas with the, the scrimmage, now a team retained possession. And so I think it was just a bigger deal for a team to, um, you know, maybe, maybe they talked about fumbles before 82, but we know they did in, in 82. And I think it was just that, that they, um, because they retained possession, fumbling and turning it over to the other team meant you screwed up and it was a loss of possession, you know, and it wasn't like, like you didn't put it in scrum anymore, you know, you just plain old lost the ball, and that was it. So now the other team was on offense. Yeah, that's pretty high watermark uh, for that period of time. You, if you sit there and think about it, what, you, what you're describing is you had a, a point uh, change in 1982, you know, shortly before this game started. Uh, this is one of the first games that was played under those rules. You had the possession 
uh, of changing, and you had down and distance introduced to, to the game. So those are pretty uh, dramatic changes uh, that really set, set football apart from from rugby at the time. You're saying yeah, so. Those are the kinds of things like you know, um, I, I'm not positive about the scoring, uh, but the other two that those are Walter Camp's ideas. Yeah. So when it's among the things that when they say he's the father of football, well, that's an yeah. example. You know? Yeah. Most definitely. And I, when I, I was doing some research on this, I looked at, I was looking at Princeton's games from the season prior to that. And the scores were all like one to nothing and, you know, three to one, you know, it's, it's more like soccer scores. Uh, the score of this game, I don't know if we said it, but the score of this Lafayette game was 54 to seven in favor of Princeton. And they had some other games that were like 60 to, to nil and you know, some games of, you know, blowouts, what we would call today in college football. So definitely a, a, a big difference for, for people that are, are watching football from one year to the next. It's, uh, it's night and day. Yeah. So, I mean, b- before 82, the scoring was, people call it the, you know, equivalency scoring. Because it was just really, there were some odd combinations. But basically, you could um, – you know, you scored by kicking a goal and you could kick a goal. There were basically two ways to kick a goal. One was kicking a goal from field, very similar to what we consider a field goal today. I mean, you know, you, uh, you, uh, you kicked it from scrimmage, you know, a scrimmage play, you kicked it, though they typically drop kicked it at the time. And if you got it, got it, you got one point. You could also um score a goal after scoring a touchdown so back then or originally you know until 81 82 you didn't get any points or anything for scoring a touchdown what touchdown did for you is it gave you a free kick to score a goal so you know Uh, if you have the chance you know you you're better like if you're on the five yard line you're better off trying to score a touchdown so you get a free kick or goal rather than a uh, rather than attempt a contested uh, scrimmage uh, kick. Oh, so, okay. And so then there was, um, but then they still kind of wanted to give a certain amount of credit for those who got touchdowns but missed the goal. So they had this thing that where like a touchdown was, was basically a quarter of a goal. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so the scoring was just kind of goofy. But so you basically won or lost based on a number of goals if the teams were tied in terms of how many goals they had scored, then they looked at how many touchdowns, you know, if one team had more touchdowns than the other, and then that team would have won. What a it's philosophical weird. difference uh, to what we look at today. That's, yeah. that's for sure. So, well, it's a great story of the evolution of scoring in football, and uh, we appreciate you, you sharing this with us. How, I want you to let the folks know how they can get these daily tidbits in their inbox each day or where to find them elsewhere. Yeah, so, um, you know, the best way – um, if you're interested in this stuff, go to www.footballarchaeology.com and just subscribe. You can subscribe for free. Uh, you can do paid subscriptions that give you some additional benefits. Um, some of what I write is available only to paid subscribers, but the tidbits are, are all uh, free as well as most of my articles. Um, and you can also uh, follow me on Twitter or on Facebook. Um, you know, but basically the, the value of, of subscribing is you get it in your inbox every day. So you never miss, you never miss beat. All right. And we will have those links uh, where you can find Tim and football archaeology and his articles and his tidbits in the show notes of this very podcast and on pigskindispatch.com uh, in the accompanying article. So Tim, thank you once again, and we'll talk to you again next week. Cool. Thanks so much, Darren. Peeking up at the clock, the time's running down. We're going to go into victory formation, take a knee, and let this baby run out. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you back tomorrow for the next podcast. We invite you to check out our website, pigskindispatch.com, not only to see the daily football history, but to experience positive football with our many articles on the good people of the game, as well as our own football comic strip, Cleet Marks Comics. Pigskindispatch.com is also on social media outlets, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and don't forget the Pigskin Dispatch YouTube channel to get all of your positive football news and history. Special thanks to the talents of Mike and Gene Monroe, as well as Jason Neff for letting us use their music during our podcast.
This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. It was just another ordinary day in the offices of the Pittsburgh Guardian newspaper circa 1924. But for Marla Delft, assistant editor, everything was about to change. For she was about to discover the awesome attractiveness of Row 1 brand retro sports paraphernalia items, thanks to Orville Mulligan, sports writer. And there it is. Wow, Orville, that's really the bee's knees. Isn't it just? A poster-sized replica of the actual 1909 World Series program cover. I can see that. But where did you get it? And where'd you get it framed? I ordered it from the Row 1 website where over 6,000 items of sports memorabilia from the 1880s to the 1990s are available for reproduction in multiple sizes and in several different materials, with over a dozen styles of frame to choose from for prints like this. Well, I'm sure Mr. Delft would love to put up more of these in the office. But I'm equally as sure they're beyond this newspaper's budget. <laughs> Not at all, my dear Marla. See for yourself. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one. SportsHistoryNetwork.com slash row one. Oh my, these are good prices. Oh, and look at this stuff. Oklahoma, Nebraska football. College basketball art. Michael Jordan items. And so Retro it was that Marla Delft discovered the spondiferous magic of row one sports memorabilia arts and prints. You can too by visiting SportsHistoryNetwork.com slash row one. That's R O W. Number one today for access to the full Row One catalog of gallery prints and gifts like t shirts, long sleeve shirts, telephone cases, coffee mugs, blankets, pillows, towels, and even shower curtains. Act today for a 15% discount off all prints with coupon code SHN15 and 20% off all other items with coupon code SHN20 at checkout. And keep your dial locked to the Sports History Network for the exciting chronicles of the 1920 sports world in Orville Mulligan, sports writer, coming soon. Oh,